In this video, we will discuss six types of simple machines. Now, these are called simple machines because they have only one kind of mechanism in each of the machine, which give rise to a desired force or a motion. So the six simple machines that we will discuss are levers, pulleys, gears, inclined planes or wedge, wheel and axle and finally screw. Okay, so let's discuss each one of those. So we'll start with the levers. Now levers typically have three primary things. One is a pivot point or also known as fulcrum, an input force or also known as effort and an output which is also called load or resistance. So something like this where you have let's say a platform or a bar and you have a pivot point and you have an input force let's say called Fn and then there is an output force at another end okay so we have a fulcrum here this is the fulcrum we have an input force that's your effort and you have an output force uh, or, or a load or a resistance so the basic idea with the lever is to either apply a small amount of effort to gain on the output force or the load resistance so for example let's say you're trying to lift a heavy load and you don't have the capability to do that either manually or by using a motor or another kind of machine then you can employ a lever to gain on the force another use for a lever is to gain on the motion not necessarily on the force so remember the work done always has to be same assuming that is there is a hundred percent efficiency in the system then you will either gain on the forces or on the motion but not simultaneously on both of them. Now levers are typically classified as three kinds of lever, first class lever, second class lever and third class lever. So let's discuss first class lever first. So first class lever. First class lever are defined by the fact that the, the fulcrum or the pivot is between the input and the output. Okay, so that probably tells you that the relative location of the input fulcrum and the output force will decide basically what different classes of the levers are. So in this case the analysis is fairly simple. Let's say this is the point O. Point O is the point of rotation and let's say this distance from here to here is D1 and this distance from here to here is D2. Assuming that these forces are acting in a direction perpendicular to the length of this platform then we can do a simple equilibrium analysis assuming this is an equilibrium so we'll take moment about point O equated to zero. So if we take moment of force, input force, so that's Fn times D1, that'll be positive because that'll go in the counterclockwise direction. Then the moment of output force will be F out times D2 equal to zero. So we get F output divided by F input equal to D1 over D2. So from this we can see as to how the forces on the output would increase or magnify in relation to the force at the input. So larger the D1 is compared to D2. So if D1 is over D2 is greater than 1, then we will have a magnification of the force on the output. So let's do an example. Let's say the input force is equal to 5 Newton and D1 over D2 is given to you as 2 over 1. You know, we also call it 2 is to 1 ratio. Then the output force would be equal to d1 over d2 times f input from this formula over here and that would be 2 times 5 so that's 10 newton so because of the magnification factor which is 2 over here you on the output you're getting a force of 10 newtons in other words if let's say you employ a first class lever with the 2 to 1 uh, distance ratio then you can actually lift load that's twice the input load okay so that's an example of a first class, first class lever so let me give you a, a real example of a first class lever 
and we have in this case a hammer okay so what you're doing over here is you're using this hammer to take a nail out right so here is the, my nail is a different color so I have here is my nail okay so that's my output because I'm trying to take this out and then I have my fulcrum so I'm going to essentially rest this uh, this hammer against some stationary surface and then I'm applying an input force in this direction to take the nail out okay so let's see where the fulcrum is located relative to the input and output forces we can clearly see that the fulcrum is at a which is between input and output okay now we can again do the analysis by taking the moment about point a so sigma m a being equal to zero if we do that then the input force let's call it f n so this is f n times d1 that's going to be positive minus f out so this is the f output force times d2 equal to zero and we will get the same relationship that we had before which is this is equal to d1 over d2 so as long as d1 is more than d2 in other words as long as your input force is being applied at a distance uh, larger compared to the output from the fulcrum then we will have force magnification okay what about second class lever let's discuss second class lever so second class levers are defined by the fact that the output or the load or the resistance is between the fulcrum and the input so let's say I have my previous platform then here is my fulcrum and somewhere here is let's say my output force and here is my input force okay so let's say that again the distance from from the fulcrum to the input is d1 and the distance from fulcrum to output force is d2 and let's say this is point o we can again write sigma m o equal to zero and i will get input force so f n times d1 now this will be negative in this case plus f out times d2 equal to zero and i'll get f out over f n equal to d1 over d2 so the relationship remains same okay now in this case is d1 more than d2 yes so d1 is more than d2 that means output force divided by input force will be more than one so again we have a force advantage or a force magnification so for a little effort you are getting more on the output side right so what is a practical example of a second class lever so a practical example of a second class lever is a wheelbarrow so this is a wheelbarrow and we can do analysis on this so first of all let's see whether this is indeed a second class lever or not so here is my load that's in the downward direction so this could be basically the representative of the weight that you have inside the wheelbarrow here is my fulcrum at point a and this is where my input is because you're going to push it up and then you're going to drag it or roll it in one of the directions so clearly the output or the load is between the fulcrum and the input so this is an example of a second class lever so we can again do the analysis and I would not you know do this analysis again because we know that this is valid for all the cases all the input force and the output forces are acting in a direction perpendicular to um, to the to the moment arm from the point A so I will have force advantage in this case as well uh, another example of a, a second class lever is a bottle opener so let's look at an example of a bottle opener So in this case let's see where our fulcrum is where our input is and where our output is so clearly the input is going to be over here okay so this is where you'll be trying to push it up so this is where, where my input force is okay and then output force is definitely over here uh, right where it is in contact right so that's where the input force is so that's the, the that's sorry the output force not input force and this is where the fulcrum is right because this is where it will be in rest and then you'll be pushing it up and then the output force will be in the downward direction okay so in this case again you can see that because the output is between the fulcrum and the input this is a second class lever now what about the final category of the lever which is the third class lever so third class lever 
Now in case of a third class lever, the input is between the fulcrum and the output. So let me draw my platform again. And here is my fulcrum or the pivot. And this is where my, let's say input is. And this is where my output is. So remember, our equilibrium analysis is still whole. So sigma, let's say this is D1 and this is D2. So I'm, I'm always using D1 as the distance from the fulcrum to the input force and D2 as the distance from fulcrum to the output force. We know that even in this case, F output over F input is equal to D1 over D2. So this is input. Okay. Now in this case, you can see that actually D1 is less than D2, right? Because D1 is closer to the fulcrum than D2 is, which means that this is less than one. So what, what this means is that that there is no mechanical advantage in terms of the force. So you don't have output force larger than the input force. In fact, you have to apply a larger input force to, to get you know, a lower output force. So the question is, what are we gaining in this case? Well, what we're gaining in this case is actually the range of motion. So you can imagine that if this is the point uh, of rotation, then uh, with respect to point O, the, the point of application of the output force will be traveling a larger distance compared to the input force, right? So you actually gain on the range of motion and you have several examples of a third class lever out there in the nature. So for example, a fishing rod. Okay, so if you look at a fishing rod, let me make it a little bit smaller. If you get a fishing rod, let's see where our input is and where our output is. So first of all, you will hold the fishing rod stationary at one point, okay? So let's say you're holding it stationary here, okay? That's where you're holding it. So this is this is your sort of fulcrum. So let's call this to be point A or the fulcrum. And then you will be basically applying a force on the fishing rod in this direction. So that will be your input force. Yes, that will be your input force. And this is where your load is. So this is where your load is. So this is your output. All right. So you can see that the input force is between the fulcrum, which is A, and the output force. Right. Your input force is closer to the fulcrum, which means that you will not have any force advantage in this case. So what, what you're getting in this case is actually the range of motion because you want the tip of your fishing rod to be able to travel large distances so that you can go farther and closer and that way you can cover a much larger area to catch your fish. So there is no force advantage in this case, but you have the distance advantage. So in this case, we say for a third class lever, we have actually a distance magnification Okay, and remember the work done is always defined as a force times displacement. So you are losing on the force in this case, but you're gaining on the displacement. Another example of a third class lever is a tong. Okay, so let me bring this in here. Okay, so that's the tong. Let me make it a little bit smaller. Now you can again see where the input forces are and where the output forces are. So first of all, it's clear that your fulcrum is here. This is your fulcrum. Okay, where is your input force? Your input force is here because that's where you're pushing it. And your output is here, right? So the force with which you try to wrap this strawberry is where you're applying an output force. Now, again, you can see that your input is closer to the fulcrum, so you will not have any distance, you, don't, you would not have any force advantage. But in this case, you actually need more uh, on, more on the motion side. You need a larger range of motion so that you can open this tongue up and you can hold this strawberry. Uh, another example of a, of a third class lever you find in the nature is actually the beak of the bird. Now, beaks of the of birds are very interesting because by looking at the beaks, you can tell at what kind of food they eat. So for example, if you look at a woodpecker, the beak of a woodpecker is more like a wedge or an inclined plane. So that's actually a simple machine. Uh, for another kind of bird where the beak is stout and thicker and, and, and smaller in, in length, uh, maybe they're, they're, the kind of food that they eat is is not something that they need to, to press or to crack open because they don't have teeth, right? Birds don't have teeth. So they have to essentially either cut things open or they have to swallow them completely. So their beak essentially helps them you know, get their food in the right way. So why is this a third class lever? So let's look at it. So for example, let's say if the nut or any food that was placed over here, then this would give rise to an output force here. So the, clearly the output would be here or the load. Okay. And then somewhere we can see via some structure, this is where the fulcrum would be. And the input force 
is being applied somewhere here. Okay, so input force is clearly closer to the fulcrum than the output force is. So this is an example of a third class lever. In fact, certain other kinds of birds have much more complicated mechanism to operate their beaks. Uh, one of them is a four bar linkage system that we have seen before. Another example of a third class lever is human arm. So in this case, let's look at where the fulcrum is, where the input is, and where the output is. So we can see clearly that my output is here. So if you draw free body out of the hand alone without the ball, then this is where the output is or the load is. Somewhere here would be the fulcrum. And your muscles have to apply the effort or the input force. So this is where input is. So you can again see that your input is closer to the fulcrum than it is to the output, right? So in this case also, you will not have any force advantage, but you will gain on the motion. In fact, we need that more, we need that more than the force advantage in this case, because we need to be able to reach out and grab different things at different places uh, at distance from human body. So we actually need uh, something like this more than the force advantage.